She paints pictures with her words, invites us to open our minds and our hearts to the possibilities of life. And she shares intimate conversations with us without having to whisper, just between you and me. <laughs> she has earned our respect and won our affection. Please welcome Susan Stamberg of National Public Radio and the author of Talk, Susan Stamberg Considers All Things, which is a delightful read, by the way. Well, I'm going to move here. I really like it so much. I want Phil to run everything. <laughs> Why don't you come to Washington and run NPR for a while? Then when you get finished fixing that, run the country. <laughs> Take care of the Congress. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you very much for having me here, although I know I'm the beard. This is the I'm Allergic to Roses Society of Portland, isn't it? And that's why you're here tonight. <laughs> Happy anniversary, by the way. You don't look 80. But then neither do I. <laughs> do you remember what Ingrid Bergman said? At 40, you get the face that you deserve. I'm still waiting. <laughs> it's one thing to be getting older. It's quite another to be out of fashion, which is how I have been feeling lately in your nation's capital, which is where National Public Radio is based. But uh, also feeling old-fashioned, reading, hearing, and traveling as I sometimes do, even this minute, throughout the land to various places. I am part, I know you're not going to believe this, but I'm part of a generation that was raised to believe that government stood for the public good. Can you imagine? <laughs> that it was there to serve the public, to serve community. And I know that that's a theme of yours, uh, your current issue here that government was there to help the most helpless citizens of the society as well as those who were in more hopeful situations. Uh, I've so much enjoyed the recent 50th anniversary celebrations uh, of the end of World War II. Uh, they've reminded me of what it was like then, uh, being a little girl when the, when the war ended and, and hearing the jubilation on the radio, of course, because that was the only medium there was, apart from the great newspapers of those days, and seeing for the first, and I think probably the only time in my life, my father cry uh, when the news came that Franklin Roosevelt had died, and remembering so well thinking then that uh, we had lost the only president of the United States that there had ever been because he certainly was the only president I had ever known as a child. He had been in office for such a long time. And then seeing him succeeded by a giant of a, a haberdasher, he was certainly no patrician the way Roosevelt was, but he was clearly a hell of a guy. And as a person who grew into young adulthood in the dull and proper 50s, and I bet uh, a number of you were there with me then, it all seemed such a sane time. Can you remember those days, how sane things were? Yes, of course, uh, sturdy and secure. And it's true, so much of it was, even though there was HUAC, and there was McCarthyism, and there was the internment of Japanese Americans, and the development of the atomic bomb, and segregation and discrimination, although the armed forces certainly did a lot to reverse that for succeeding generations. There were many, many abuses, as there always are in life. But it certainly was a time of shared values and shared optimism, when Americans felt pride about themselves and their country and were willing to do what it took and to make the sacrifices and lean into the hard jobs to forge a future that was sound. I wonder, especially uh, for the, the younger ones among you here tonight, whether this sounds, in 1995, as if I'm describing some never-never land that couldn't possibly have existed, some alien nation that is almost unimaginable now. I bet, it, I bet it sounds that way to you. Because so many of these values and assumptions that we had back then have changed. And there are a number of reasons that they changed. Watergate changed them, Vietnam before that. Television did it, so did the popular culture, and that was true even before Bob Dole decided to run for president and use that as a cause. Although there was so 
so much truth in what he said, and we it struck a national chord, and it wasn't simply amongst uh, Republicans. Those uh, 40s and 50s ideals and beliefs seem so out of fashion now. They're part of something that is past, never to return. But your theme uh, this year, rebuilding community, suggests to me that you too lament some of the changes that we've seen taking place in our society, and not just here, really throughout the world, especially in these recent years. The separation that we see into angry camps, some of those armed militias that, that are looking for revenge against the government, and the factionalism and rioting and fist shaking, fist shaking that we've seen on our shores. I'm thinking, of course, of the Los Angeles riots, but not just about them, but uh, and a, a level of rage and hatred that, that we see reflected overseas in ex-Yugoslavia, also in some of the uh, uh, most depressed nations uh, in Africa. Massacres, this is the state of our world today. Mysterious diseases, bombings, poisoning on subways. The world feels a lot more dangerous lately, much more splintered and much more splintering. Well, I'm afraid to confess to you that I am uh, not here with any pat reassurances, and that's probably a very good thing. The guys in the white hats are the ones who do that, and they are to be deeply mistrusted. But I think I can, I can uh, speak out about what I've seen happening in some communities that I know a little bit about, and perhaps there are lessons in them that can apply to other places. And I'll begin with broadcasting, and most particularly public broadcasting, as I am a public broadcasting chauvinist, as you may know. We have been under a good deal of attack lately, as the 104th Congress uh, sets up shop on Capitol Hill. It's not over yet, but it seems as if the worst threats are likely not to happen. Uh, those worst threats were that we would go to zero federal funding, which is just a tiny little fraction of our budget, uh, but still an important one, and, and a minute, it's 0.001% of the federal budget the money that goes to public broadcasting. But anyway, that we won't go to zero federal funding instantly or see funding cuts that uh, go too deeply, too precipitously. Uh, uh, these were some of the threads, not to mention Senator Larry Pressler's early request that all national public radio staff people fill out questionnaires. I wonder if you read about this. Uh, asking us uh, the level of contributions that we had made to various political campaigns, uh, what our employment history was with Pacifica radio stations, and my favorite question, our connections to evangelical broadcast organizations. <laughs> I can tell you that that one had my colleague Daniel Shore and me scared stiff. <laughs> oh no, what if they find out? <laughs> I have to tell him I said that. He'll get a kick out of it. <laughs> Somebody yelled witch hunt. They were right. So Presley withdrew those questions. Anyway, it appears, uh, I hope this is true, that the very worst will not happen and public radio will not face the immediate possibility anyway that we might lose some 200 member stations. We have a total of 524. Uh, lose them simply because they wouldn't be able to stay on the air or pay their dues to get NPR programs without... Uh, their, their uh, fragment of the federal funding. But it's not over. We still face three years of federal cuts uh, and then the cut to zero in 1998. So we are going to be reorganized and there will be pe people who will lose their jobs. But uh, uh, our company has made some proposal which, uh, proposals which, if accepted, would protect us we hope from too much damage. And the Congress, especially the Speaker of the House, is hearing a good deal from constituents, interestingly enough, about just how important public radio is to them. Now there's my idea of community in action, a community of listeners who put pressure on their representatives in Congress. It's how it's supposed to work in a democracy, and it is reassuring to see that it still does work that way without hundreds and thousands, maybe millions, of lobbying dollars being spent and hefty paying special interest group connections. It's just being done by ordinary citizens who like what they hear on the radio and don't want to lose it. NPR listeners do indeed have special interests, though. They care about excellence in broadcasting, and balanced and thorough coverage of contemporary issues. 
they, you, I assume, care about information on our cultural life, and everybody likes a few good laughs, and I hope we provide that as well. And talk about communities. Uh, it has been the pattern that the way public radio grows, <clears throat> sorry, is when a loyal listener moves from one town to another and discovers that the new town has no public radio station. This is true. I've lost count of how many times I've been told this story, and it's one that I cherish. So they start one of their own. I mean, they decide they can't live without it, so they begin it. We have a community of listeners across this country, people who sit next to one another on airplanes and find that they have something in common because they listen to all things considered, for example. There's an instant bond. And also one of my favorite stories, nobody's told it to me tonight, but it's probably just lurking there uh, at one of those tables. Uh, a listener who, who comes and says, that they, they have spent their lives moving all around. And they'll say, we listened to you. We lived in one place when we were in junior high school. I'm not so crazy to hear that one. <laughs> <laughs> I lived in this place when I was in junior high, and then we moved there when I was in high school, and I kept listening. And then we moved there in college, uh, and uh, there in graduate, graduate school someplace else. And they say, the only thing that remained constant was you on NPR. In a nation of strangers, where moving is certainly the status quo, knowing that radio can build community is most reassuring. And I hope this will continue, that wherever you are, we are the sound of home. That notion is one that I hold very close to my heart. I do not hold G. Gordon Liddy close to the heart, however, <clears throat> or even to the ear. Now, all of you remember, well, most of you do, Mr. Liddy from the Watergate days before he got his own radio talk show. In his White House days, and this was before he broke into the Watergate complex and got convicted of conspiracy, burglary, and wiretapping, wire and spent four and a half years serving time, his idea of a good time was to go down to the Lincoln Memorial when the war protesters were down there uh, holding candlelit vigils and uh, use their candles to light his cigar. That's the kind of classy guy he was back in the 70s. And these days, his idea of a good time and good broadcasting is to give his listeners precise lessons in how to shoot federal agents. Shoot them in the head, is what he said, in case they, the agents cross your doorstep by surprise. He was criticized for that broadcast, thank goodness, but at the end of this very month, Gordon Liddy is going to receive the 1995 Freedom of Speech Award from the National Association of Radio Talk Show Hosts. This is an association we must all be sure not to join. <laughs> Last year, they gave their award to Mario Cuomo who is launching his own talk show on Saturday mornings. Surely Cato Kalin cannot be far behind. <laughs> In the talk show sweepstakes. Anyway, this year they chose Gordon Liddy, who already has his own talk show. At least they didn't choose Howard Stern, who made fun of the music of that young Latina, what was her name, Selena, was it? Young Latina entertainer on the very day of her funeral. The National Association of Radio Talk Show Hosts applauds Gordon Liddy for, quote, exercising his right to freely express his opinions, particularly in voicing political speech, which is critical of the government. Well, my dears, so much is excused, so much permitted, so much applauded in the name of free speech. Our founding fathers, when they protect, and mothers, when they protected our right to criticize our government and speak in freedom, had absolutely no idea that one day mass media would make it possible to convey instructions to millions of listeners across this country as to how to shoot another human being. A community of listeners convened every day about, around the electronic hearth of radio, getting carefully taught by a convicted felon. Now, believe me, I'm not calling for censorship. Far be it from me. Please understand this. But as a broadcaster with more than 30 years experience in front of microphones, and somebody who worries sometimes in the dark night of her soul whether all these years of reasoning with listeners and being careful and checking the facts and sticking to the facts have been for absolutely nothing, when the Liddies and the Stearns, and yes, even in different ways, the Limbaugh's of this world prevail, 
As a broadcaster, I don't call for censorship, but I absolutely call for responsibility by my fellow broadcasters, of course. That's just obvious. And we need to go beyond them. Responsibility by the men and women who put them on the air, who own the stations, who watch, have, need to look at something more than the bottom line, who pay for their commercials, and then tune in to hear them. If you qualify in any one of those categories, stop. I beg you. Think twice. Think a third time, even. Don't let murderous, uninformed brutalities amuse you on the airwaves. Don't permit yourself to be entertained, even titillated, by puerile observations of a handful of men, and sadly enough, a few women, too, who are lucky enough to have access to airwaves, which I believe are sacred, and who end up misusing them so horribly, using them to destroy community, to create anger, to disrupt civility, to shrink and distort the common good instead of advancing it. Oof. That's the end of my sermonette. On to other matters. Thank you for Starbucks. <laughs> Talk about sublime to ridiculous. I know it was Seattle. But yours over there in Pioneer Square was the very first Starbucks I ever set foot in. Portland, of course, has always been ahead of the game. Starbucks finally came to New York City last year. Uh, it was a massive invasion. They opened stores on every other corner of Manhattan. And the New Yorker magazine was a little peevish about all of this. Here's what they wrote. It used to be, they wrote, that you would make a date to meet a friend at dot, 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 that coffee shop, the article said. And now, with all those Starbucks, when you say, meet me at Starbucks instead of meet me at that coffee shop. Nobody knows which Starbucks you meet. So you have to do east and west and name the avenues. It's just all too difficult, the New Yorker said, to remember those good old days when life was a whole lot simpler. These New Yorkers, you know, <laughs> always provincial. It's my hometown, so I can get away with saying bad things about them. But we had Starbucks in your nation's capital long before New York got it, although considerably after Portland, naturally. And a store that opened on a corner in my neighborhood. Uh, uh, I live in, a, a, in the District of Columbia, close to the Maryland line. That's that neighborhood Starbucks, interestingly enough, just to get back sort of this, to this theme of community, has created community where it hadn't existed before. Young mothers who are isolated these days, just as I remember being at home in that neighborhood with small children in individual separated houses, have gotten into a pattern of dropping the older child off at the local elementary school early in the morning and then showing up in Starbucks in the morning after that with their babies in their strollers to have co coffee clutches together. And it, it really serves the purpose in Washington that playgrounds in Manhattan used to serve where all, all the mothers would come with the strollers and sit around. Uh, they brought the babies and, and formed communities of mothers sitting in the park and watching the little ones play in the sandbox. We had no such area in my Washington uh, neighborhood when our boy was small. Uh, that was 25 years ago. But today, thanks to Starbucks, those mothers uh, are less isolated. And it turns out, this is not a commercial for Starbucks, although if they care to make a contribution to public broadcasting, I wouldn't <laughs> turn it away. But it turns out that the need for community is so strong and so many of our cities have such trouble satisfying that need that a simple little shop that charges too much for a very good cup of coffee <laughs> can serve as a kind of crossroads where people can meet and communicate and talk about their concerns and more than that, to d and can do something about them. I always, when I go in there, hear some kind of organizing going on. It reminds me of you folks here at the City Club. They're organizing in the Starbucks. Somebody wants to get something done at the school, or they want to get a pothole fixed, or recycling started again. We're having our troubles in your nation's capital, thanks to our mayor for life, <laughs> who had a little problem with cocaine. We don't discuss that too much. Anyway, they're sitting in Starbucks, worrying about it, and looking for solutions to that problem. And it's very interesting to me that a coffee shop has taken the place of what our founding fathers always built into the original colonial towns, which was a common, some kind of central square.
where the animals could graze. It's why it was called a commons, because uh, they used the land in common for the grazing of the animals, and also people could congregate. The founders knew a whole lot more about community than we have forgotten in our modern ways. A few weeks ago, the great Yale art historian Vincent Scully presented uh, the annual Jefferson Lecture in the, in the Humanities in Washington. It's an NEH lecture series, and it's quite an honor to be chosen for it. Uh, his theme was the architecture of community. He didn't talk about Starbucks, but, but he did uh, speak about other elements of our built environment, which brought people together in new ways, much as this river area across from this hotel does. And I understand that uh, some work that you've all done in a study and report had some influence in the, in the creation uh, of that area. Uh, Scully talked about the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, uh, for example, which is surely uh, the greatest piece of public sculpture to be created in our lifetimes on the Mall in Washington. I hope you uh, have all seen it, or next time you go to Washington, you'll take time out and, and make a point of going to see it. It's extraordinary. Black granite, designed by a woman named Maya Lin when she was just 21 years old, an architecture student at Yale. I think she was a student of Scully's, actually. Uh, and he said in her memorial, you see the possibility of a new community in America made up of all the different kinds of people that we are. As all kinds of people, men, women, blacks, gays, move up and down in front of that surface, they are reflected in it and reach out and touch their dead and bring those veterans who thought that their country had cast them out back into the human community once again. He says that's what that wall does, and it does. Scully also said that in our greatest works, you feel the grandeur of nat nature and the brotherhood of mankind. And thinking about it, that seems to me a wonderful way to measure the worth of old creations as well as new ones, and a good set of demands that all of us ought to make of any undertaking. Does it incorporate and respect nature and the natural? Does it enhance, further, or reveal the brother and sisterhood of humanity? These themes of architecture, what we build and how we fit into what we build, have been on my mind a good deal lately uh, in connection with some recent reporting that I've done on NPR. Uh, after uh, many, many years as a news hen, I was 14 years uh, anchoring All Things Considered and then another three uh, on our, our uh, Sunday morning program, Weekend Edition on Sunday. These days, I have a different title. I'm a special correspondent at National Public Radio. Uh, primarily, I cover cultural issues, and this is really a wonderful plum for me. Uh, my heart has always been with the arts and the humanities far more than with the news, and the thing that got me through all those heavy, tough news days was uh, very often knowing that maybe at 4 o'clock I could interview John Irving or Ursula Le Guin, whatever, that there'd be an artist at the end of my day. It was kind of a carrot that got me through. Today, uh, there's the whole enchilada. I gave up carrots. <laughs> what Vincent Scully said in his Jefferson Lecture reminded me of two artists whose work I have been paying attention to lately for National Public Radio. Uh, Scully described how modern urbanism ruined our cities in the 1960s. I know you protected pretty well against that here in Portland. He told about uh, Le Corbusier, the French architect uh, in the 1920s, who said how awful old, narrow streets were, Corbusier said, where you have to look at the faces of other human beings all the time. So depressing. Let's get rid of it. Clean it up. And Scully said that the architects responded by creating these huge anonymous super blocks and cross highways so nobody had to look at anybody anymore. Thanks so much. That was all done in the 1960s when there was lots of federal money to be spent, in Scully's words, to do the wrong thing. Uh, no, I do not think it is part of the argument that we need to stop throwing federal money at problems because Scully says today when everybody knows a lot better, there won't be any federal money to help solve urban, urban problems. Anyway, all this reminded me, as I said, of the work of two painters that I've been uh, studying lately for broadcast. Edward Hopper of the United States, you're probably familiar with his work, and a man named Gustave Kayabat, Kayabat of France. I hadn't known of him, but I'll tell you a little bit about him when we get to it. Mark Strand, who uh, uh, was the former 
poet laureate of the United States, re recently wrote a book about Hopper, and I did a report about it. Strand started, as, uh, started out as a young man uh, majoring in art. Later he turned to poetry, but he never lost his interest in, in painting. And this little book that he did on Hopper is full of some really wonderful observations. To Strand, the paintings that Hopper does look like scenes, he says, that he saw as a child from the back seat of his parents' cars. Incomplete stories, lives seen, he says, at street level. That woman, do you remember her leaning out the window, kind of staring into a very cold sun? That man staring into space at the gas station, the big red, I think it's an SO gas tank right behind him. Those people in the nighttime diner, remember them, who look as if they're drinking coffee from hell? There was no Starbucks when, uh, when he did that painting. You know that painting, it's called Nighthawks. You've seen it dozens of times. I saw it walking around town today on posters and on coffee mugs in, in uh, shops and also on greeting cards. And this idea of Mark Strand's, uh, of glimpsed lives, unfinished stories, connected for me with, uh, with what Scully said about the old view of cities when you had to look at the faces of human beings. The urban places that we've created put those lives on upper floors now of tall buildings. We can't see them from the back of cars anymore. Edward Hopper painted what to me seemed to be extremely lonely and isolated people, not making connections, even though they lived at street levels and were surrounded by other lives. Think how the tall buildings that went up later, Ho Hopper died uh, as those buildings were being built in 19... 67. Uh, that was 20 years after he painted Nighthawks. He did that in 47. But, but uh, uh, the building boom was certainly on at the time of his death. So think how tall buildings would have made those Hopper people even more alienated. And at the Art Institute of Chicago, which owns that painting by Hopper, Nighthawks, there was just an exhibit of the work of this Frenchman, Gustave Kayabat, I'll spell it for you, C-A-I-L-L-E-B-O-T-T-E. -T -T -E. I'm sure my pronunciation is terrible. He was uh, a 19th century urban impressionist, they call him, known to me initially because of uh, this monumental painting he did of a man and a woman under a gray umbrella. They're over in the corner of this giant canvas on a massive cobblestone street in Paris. Have you seen this image? It's called Paris Street Rainy Day, and he did it in 1877. You may know it again from Mugs and Umbrellas, which is a pretty good way to get art around. Kayabat did not have a, a much of a public life as a painter, which is why I think we don't know him as well. He, but he he painted like crazy. He did at least 500 paintings. But he kept them in the family, so he never became as well known as Monet or Renoir. But he was an extremely rich man. He came from a very rich family. And he was a great patron of the arts. He bought up works by his friends Manet, Monet, Renoir. He had a very nice set of friends, Degas, Cezanne. And those works eventually became the heart of the Impressionist collection at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, so he had wonderful taste as well as uh, being a, a, a lovely and generous person to kind of get, get bread on the table of his friends. In the work that he did, though, Kayabat was painting what was happening to Paris when uh, Baron Georges Eugène Haussmann began turning it into a modern city. Haussmann was the one who put in uh, those uh, huge boulevards and, and iron bridges and rows of identical big apartment buildings. To us, uh, when you see pictures of them or go to Paris, they look so beautiful and, and a little bit quaint, those very embellished uh, buildings of the 19th century in Paris with the, the green mansard roofs on them and all the trimming. But back then, they were modern. And more than that, they stood for modernism. And there was Kayabat as an urban impressionist painting people as he saw them being isolated and ignored by these new structures. His streets are enormous. Think of the huge cobblestones with the folks with the umbrellas. Uh, and his people, who were very prettily dressed in the style of the day, the ladies with the parasols and uh, umbrellas and long skirts and top hats, they look lost on those huge, huge streets. They're alone while they share common space. He paints, see, as one painting of a man leaning on a bridge railing and looking down, and he's absolutely engulfed by the huge girders of that bridge. He's dwarfed by the bridge. He's isolated just the way Hopper's people were in the 1930s and 50s. Uh, I'm talking about bridges. I had such an experience today. Some of the folks who helped me have it are here. I actually climbed up to the bridge tender's cabin on your Hawthorne Bridge. 
The steps are this wide. My feet are not. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> anyway, I didn't feel isolated there because I was in the company of very warm people. But the Kayabat exhibit just co closed in uh, Chicago. It's going to open at the Los Angeles County Museum uh, the end of this month, June 25th. And it's going to be there through the 10th of September. And if you're planning a trip south, I really urge you to stop in and see that. It is something. It's spectacular. Anyway, these artists, Kayabat and Hopper, were painting what happens to community as modernity progresses. They were also painting the longing for community that I think we feel from the moment we leave home and lose that very first and most basic community of our birth. They painted the feeling of modern life at two very different but similar times. In looking at their work, we are forced to feel to connect with what is going on on their canvases, to connect with our own apprehensions about change, our own search for community, forced to feel, which is what great art always does to us. The New York Public Library celebrated its uh, centennial recently, and Robert Caro, who uh, is Lyndon Johnson's biographer, wrote a wonderful piece for the New York Times about the years that he spent in the writer's room at the 42nd Street Public Library. This was in the 1970s when he was working on his very first book, and it was a biography of a man named Robert Moses, who was really the Osman of, uh, of Manhattan. He's the man, Moses uh, was, who more than anybody else created modern New York City. And Carroll had been uh, researching the Moses biography for something like five years. And with every year that passed, every new piece of information that he unearthed, and there were more and more pieces that kept being unearthed, he felt more and more isolated in the work that he was doing. Carroll had been a reporter on Newsday, and any reporter just uh, is used to being surrounded by editors and reporters and other people that you can sort of bat ideas around with. And he was missing that. He didn't have anybody to talk to. It was him and the research. So then he was admitted to the Frederick Lewis Allen Memorial Room at the New York Public Library. There's this special writer's room where a key is given. Keys are given to 11 resident writers. And they're uh, given space in that room. And they're permitted to keep books. And th this access to books was wonderful, of course. But Carol writes that what was really special about that writer's room was the fact it had other writers in it. Other human beings engaged in that difficult struggle of writing. So he goes in on the first day, and the room is full. All the other writers are there. Not a single person looked up. <laughs> this is because writers know not to interrupt themselves or other people while they're working. In fact, nobody spoke to him for the first several days. And he was wondering, what have I gotten into here? Well, then one of the writers asked him what he was working on and how long he had been at it. Five years, Caro said, although he, he had come to hate that question. It was a question everybody wa always wanted to know. And he was, uh, five years felt interminable to him. And he, th he was ashamed that it was taking him so long. Well, the other writer said, oh, that's not so long. This was uh, James Thomas Flexner, a biographer. He said, I've been working on my George Washington for nine years. And Caro writes that he could have jumped up and kissed him. <laughs> Then he said the other writers started to talk. They had spent seven years, eight years, six years, 10 years. He was so relieved. And after a while, they invited him to lunch. And they started going together every day to the employees' cafeteria in the basement of the 42nd Street Library. He says it was a very grubby place. And the food wasn't much. But for him, it was heaven, because there was a community of writers there assembling every single day, talking about their problems, the problems they were having with research, with writing, giving advice, complaining. A room in a building, it was that simple, on Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street, made it possible to have community. I think all of us long for community. And some of us find it through membership in clubs, through religion, through family, through neighborhood, through good work, or yes, through art. But there can't always be a Frederick Lewis Allen room to help make community happen. So what do we do? Well, I'll tell you, the best answer that I've heard lately came from a writer who was in Washington last month to accept the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. That's one of the most distinguished literary awards in the country. Uh, the man's name is David Gooderson, and this was his first novel. The book is called Snow Falling on Cedars. Yeah, you've read it? You know it? Uh, and it was chosen for this award over much more established writers, including Joyce Carol Oates. So it was quite a tribute. He sets this book uh, on, am I saying this right, San Pedro Island off the coast? Am I saying it right? 
uh, it's always important pronunciation for us broadcasters. Spelling, doesn't matter. But <laughs> San Pedro Island uh, off the coast of Washington State after the Second World War. And uh, they, uh, there was an enormous, uh, a, a large anyway, Japanese community on that island. And they were evacuated and interned during the war. And y many years later, in the 50s, uh, a Japanese fisherman is suspected of murder. And this is a book about racial tension, about war and love, and, and the clash of cultures. But in his Penn Faulkner acceptance speech, David Gooderson pointed out another theme in that book. For me, he said, and this is why I wrote the book, it's about the fact that we human beings are required by the very nature of our existence to conduct ourselves carefully. It's about the fact, Gooderson said, that in, in an indifferent universe, a world full of horrible accidents and inexplicable travail, the only thing we can really control is our own behavior. He went on, all we can do is to tread carefully and contribute nothing to the force of accident operating in the world. And this means great discipline and care, lest even the most casual word or gesture of ours contribute to another's suffering. I think what David Gooderson means, and it struck me so deeply, and I hope that it strikes you that way, is that with or without other people, every single one of us has to represent community. We must represent and nurture it through the actions that we take in our daily lives. That's how we build and rebuild community over and over again. Thank you for being so quiet as I speak. That really means a lot to me. It feels like I'm on the air when I can never hear anybody. <laughs> <clears throat> also, thanks for asking me to talk with you this evening and for giving me the chance to think about this idea of rebuilding community. I didn't rewrite the speech. I wrote it from scratch. Uh, and to offer you some of the answers and hope that I find in the work of the artists whom I so respectfully and joyfully get to describe to you all on the radio. Thanks for having me. Wow, how lucky we are. <laughs> what a wonderful evening. Thank you all for coming. I'll leave you with one thought. I've been reading this book, um, The Soul of Politics. I'm sure many of you have read it. But this one thought about rebuilding community that I really like in it that says, in order to find common ground, we must always move to higher ground. I love that. Thank you for coming. It was very fun. And thank you so much for having me. Good night.